Well, welcome viewers uh, to our presentation of Omnibrand, The Paradox of Global Acceptance and Local Authenticity by the wonderful Ellen Schmidt Devlin, PhD, also known as Dr. Ellen. Um, it is Shelley Gourlay, and I am the director of the Sports Product Management Program. I've met many of uh, the people who are joining us today, and some of you have not met. So thank you for joining us. Uh, Ellen is going to give, give you the benefit of her uh, research uh, through her PhD uh, dissertation. But first, let me just describe who, who Ellen is, if you haven't met her. Ellen Devlin had a long um, history at Nike where she served in many functions and in companies around uh, countries around the world. Um, several years ago, she decided to um, get her master's, and then after getting her master's, that was just not enough for her. She decided that she wanted to found a program, so with the help of Dr. Roger Best, um, they together founded the Sports Product Management Program, and uh, then she started her PhD program and can, began conducting this research. She is my friend, an amazing mentor, um, and a force of nature. Welcome, Ellen, and thank you. <laughs> thank you, Shelley, and welcome our students that are on our Zoom call, and welcome everybody that has joined us on the WebEx tonight. So I'm going to be presenting um, my dissertation. Um, I got my PhD from Case Western Reserve. Um, starting four years ago, I started attending uh, a PhD doctorate in management program in Cleveland, Ohio. And while I live in Portland, Oregon, I would travel to Cleveland every single month. So I think my 40th trip to Cleveland was in March of uh, 2020. So I had a chance of getting uh, this all finished before uh, COVID-19 started. So thank you for joining me. And I think uh, I will hopefully go through this research and leave a little bit of time on the end so that you can ask any questions that you want. My husband always tells me that I am much more interested in talking about my research than people are in listening uh, to my research. So hopefully, hopefully uh, that's not the case tonight. So um, I had a dissertation committee that helped guide me through the four years in the program. Dr. Uh, Casey Newmeyer was the chair of my committee. Uh, Dr. Kali Tenthen was uh, the executive director of our program and served on my committee. Uh, Dr. Aishabu Ozermer is a professor from Turkey, and she's also the second highest cited uh, author in this area of global and local branding, uh, was on my committee, and Dr. Roger Best here from the University of Oregon, uh, Professor Emeritus. So I can't thank them enough for helping guide me through this uh, journey. And it is a journey. If you decide to get your PhD, uh, it's the journey I was on was four years because my program did not require that we were published before we graduate. Some programs do require you to publish. Um, we are on the road to publishing. Um, we had our paper and the dissertation that you're going to see today. We had it accepted by the American um, Marketing Association Conference. Uh, we are in a revised and resubmit with the Journal of International Marketing. And next week, I'll present at the Engage Management Scholarship Conference. So um, hopefully, uh, we'll, we can move from, uh, from just a presentation to a publishing of the work that we've done. So our agenda tonight is that we'll talk about our problem of practice. And the program that I was in was called an engaged scholarship program. And so rather than just looking at uh, a topic through the lens of practice or the lens of scholarship, we look at the topic through both lenses. So what is going on on the practice side or the business side? What's going on on the scholarship side? And how do we combine those two things to build new knowledge? that can be used both on the practice side and on the scholarship side. So we'll go through the problem of practice. Then I'll talk a little bit about the literature, what is out there today, uh, what are the things that have already been discovered, and how this will contribute to the literature as we move forward. I'll talk about the research approach, the theoretical framework, uh, and then we're required to do three different studies, and I'll, I'll review those with you. 
Uh, we're also required to take a look at how what we're working on is connected to a theory. And so we chose the paradox theory. And I'll talk about that here tonight. And then just the, impl 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 <laughs> the contribution, the limitations, and the future research. So we'll get a chance to talk through that. So that we should be able to get through all of that in about 50 minutes. So the problem of practice. Those that are connected to the industry are very familiar with this. Those that are, that are connected kind of beyond this industry, um, I'll kind of fill you in on what the footwear and apparel industry is really facing around the world. And that's a level playing fields. Um, you have the Nikes and the Adidas, the Under Armors, the Lululemons on one side. You have the Antas, the X-Step, the leanings on the other side. And today you have a very level playing field. In the past, the global brands had advantages over the local brands. The local brands had advantages over the global brands. But because of digital technology and the fact that we all share social media, we have access to e-commerce, um, that, that uh, playing field is now level. So how will the brands compete when they're not just competing against each other, perhaps in their different categories of global and local, but they're competing against each other, global against local, local against global. What we've also seen, and I'll demonstrate that in the next three slides, is that oftentimes the global brands don't 100% understand the local markets that they're trying to sell in. And that's true on the local side as well. The local brands don't necessarily understand the markets beyond where they're from. You know, and as they're learning that, they're making mistakes that are costing them a tremendous amount of money. You know, so let's take a look at some of those things. The first example I'd like to use is a company that if you're in the fashion apparel business, you're probably very familiar with. You may or may not own anything from uh, Dolce & Gabbana. I think their pants sell for about $1,000. So I don't own anything from this brand. But I'm familiar with the fact that this is a luxury apparel brand that is considered, although out of Italy, is considered a global brand. You know, if you're in the fashion area, you know about this brand. So you can buy this brand any place from Tokyo to Shanghai to Berlin to London to New York City. You know, so it is a recognized global brand. But last year, 19, or two years ago, in 2018, they made one of the biggest mistakes that has ever been witnessed by a global brand. They put out four different um, five-minute uh, videos on YouTube that were considered incredibly racist. They were in Chinese, and it showed a Chinese woman basically trying to eat a pizza, uh, calzone, and I think the last thing was a dessert with chopsticks. And it was very, very offensive. And because it was so offensive, the impact that it had on that brand, and from a revenue standpoint, they, they considered the impact that it could be up to, I think it was like uh, two thirds or a third of their revenue could be decreased because of making a mistake like that. And so let's take a look at kind of the aftermath of what happened around this. The fallout from Dolce and Gabbana's controversial advertisement is forcing the brand out of China, or possibly so, prompting the company's co-founders to issue a very public apology. Le nostre famiglie ci hanno sempre insegnato a rispettare le varie culture di tutto il mondo e per questo vogliamo chiedervi scusa se abbiamo commesso degli errori nell'interpretare la vostra. Vogliamo anche chiedere scusa a tutti i cinesi nel mondo perché ce ne sono molti e prendiamo molto seriamente questo, questa scusa e questo messaggio. Dolce and Gabbana has also lost support throughout Europe and the United States. British brands and American models have already distanced themselves from the company. Well, Runan Jen is a reporter at Jing Daily, which is a digital publication that focuses on luxury businesses in China. I spoke to her earlier today about the global backlash on Dolce and Gabbana and how the brand is responding to it. Most consumers, unfortunately, they don't buy this apology at all. Uh, and this apology further, you know, reassurance that the, the brand did something wrong, and perhaps their account hasn't been hacked, and this is something they did. Um, so it's, 
And the fact that a lot of、uh, people are saying, you know, their comments on social media has been deleting. You know, the brand is not handling really well from a PR perspective. Really, really,、uh, is not helping the brand much at this moment. Do you really think, though, that Dolce and Gabbana, this famous Italian brand, could be banned from China altogether? It, it seems extraordinary that it might go that far. What do you say? It's hard to say if this brand will be banned automatically in China,、uh, but I think for the next, I would say for the next few months, even years. The, the brand would have to say how would have to see how they handle、uh, everything, and as we're saying, e-commerce already taking off their goods. So the sales channel potentially are breaking down and are forbidden at this moment, and、uh, it, it it will take a while for consumers to, you know, forgive their brand. Now the New York Times today says this could hurt Dolce and Gabbana way, way beyond China into other businesses around the world. Again, it seems extraordinary. But what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that that's possible? The brand,、um, the founder, as、uh, as well as the designer, they're both huge. Uh, they embrace the the brand identity and they stand for the brand, right? And the fact that the founder,、uh, the designer,、uh, had you know alleged、um, racist comment online、mm. was really、uh, was damaging for the branding. And I think you know as we're seeing, the designer have spoken、uh, before against Japan and as well as Europe. They have controversial. Uh, racist comment, not just in China. I think China is kind of the tipping point, because you know people are angry. It's social media. People check social media all the time,、okay. and、uh, this will have a domino effect on the brands elsewhere. So, in, so you can see a global brand that didn't really understand local authenticity, and particularly in China.、Uh, you know, in the past, if you made a mistake in a local market. It may not influence you around the world, but again, today with connectivity, whatever you do in one market is apparent to not only that market, which China is very important market, but is apparent to the entire world. So another example, more on the local side, not understanding global, and this is from 2008. And so those that remember, the Olympics were in Beijing in 2008. And Adidas was the、uh, was the sponsor of the Olympics,、um, but the flame was lit by a gymnast who also has a brand in China, Li Ning. So he came in on a high wire and he lit the cauldron, you know. So while you know Adidas is paying all the money to be associated with the Olympics, Li Ning comes in and has the biggest moment of the Olympics. So you can imagine, you know,、uh, the things that were happening around Li Ning is that they were predicting that they would be the next global brand coming out of China, but that did not happen. They actually opened a facility here in、um, Portland, Oregon, in 2010, and they closed it in 2012. So for some reason, a local brand was not able to figure out how to become globally accepted. So again, on the practice side, there seems to be something disconnected, something missing. The final example is a brand named 361, and that said, you may ask yourself, okay, on the practice side, Ellen, can't the local brands just watch the global brands and just do what they're doing, and then vice versa? And so this is an example of a brand watching what a global brand was doing and then trying to du duplicate it, and how it did not work for that brand. So, so 361 made the decision that they were going to become the official sponsor of the Olympics, and in two, 2016 they were. So they paid、uh, a big amount of mon money. All the volunteers wore th 361.、Um, the Olympics were in Rio, and I'm guessing that most of you, if you watched the 2016 Olympics, you probably didn't even know, know this. It had no impact on their market. In fact, it had a negative impact on their market. The following year, they closed a little less than, almost close to eight percent of their stores throughout China. So it did not have an impact of helping them in China, and it certainly did not have an impact of helping them outside of China. You know, so from the practice standpoint, 
here are local and global brands not able to kind of figure out the other side. So that's on the, on the practice side. On the scholarship side, what's being talked about in the literature? So all of you that are out there, you're thinking, well, what's literature? Is Ellen talking about the New York Times? You know, or, or is she talking about Wall Street Journal? So in the academy or on the academic side, literature means that anything that has been published in a journal that is peer reviewed. And so that's obviously what we're trying to get published in. But then you are assured that the information that's in there has been created because of novel research, meaning that you were the one responsible for doing the research, creating the new knowledge, and having it published. So what happens with new knowledge is you build upon the knowledge that's already there. So in the literature, um, and those that want to kind of find some literature, you, if you're at the university, you can find it through our library. If you're not, go to Google Scholar. And anything in Google Scholar is, is coming out of the journals. You know? And so that would be kind of a good start if you're interested in scholarship or the scholarship side. So what we found in the literature is that a tremendous amount of knowledge being created around global brands. And another uh, uh, incredible amount of knowledge being created around local brands. And in social science, the reason that you would see global versus local is that you want to be able to compare two things. So you can say, this is global versus this, or this is local versus this. You know, so the knowledge base in these two areas has increased tremendously over the last really 50 years. But there's something kind of in between here. And in the past, it's been called global or hybrid. And it's sort of a combination of global and local. But nobody has spent that much time in this space. Well, on the practice side, you just saw brands that couldn't really figure out global and local, right? So we made the decision that we were going to spend time here in the center. And rather than trying to build knowledge on global or local, we we're going to take a look at the center. And the reason we decided that is that that is what we began hearing during our very first study, which was a qualitative study of people in the industry. And I'll explain a little bit more about that next. So um, on the research motivation, so when you do a dissertation or you do any research on the scholarship side, you're looking for a gap. You're looking for an area that has not been investigated as deeply as it should be or as it could be. So that's what we found in this center area. We found that uh, um, compared to, the, to either side, this area had not really been looked at. You know, we found that there wasn't really an understanding of the experience of global localization. And that if people had looked at this space, there was disagreement. Rather than saying it was a third way, people were saying, well, maybe it's really global or maybe it's really local. You know, and so you didn't have research really agree upon that. So it gives you an opportunity to say, OK, we're going to take a look at it as well. And then we were also finding that because of the internet and the examples that I just gave you, that things were changing in the marketplace. And there's a lot more blending going on. So we're really an opportunity to take a closer look at this area. Now, this is a very complicated slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, other than to say that the dissertation involved three different studies. You know, So I'll talk a little bit more about these three studies. And then the fourth, fourth phase, which was bringing together those three studies into a final conclusion. And most people that make a decision to move forward with, with their PhD, when you start with what you'd like to accomplish, they always call it you know, trying to boil an ocean, you know, because there is, you believe that you can do a tremendous amount. But when you begin to research something, and you'll see at the end of the presentation, you're able to, through research, able to kind of move knowledge forward kind of incrementally, you know, because good research is really required in order to move knowledge forward. So we'll talk a little bit about how we were able to do this with this study. You'll also see that I use the word we. And so while I'm the one getting the dissertation, the, uh, the people that are helping me do that and the dissertation committee that I introduced at the beginning, they're kind of the we. You know, so my dissertation is turned in with just my name on it. But the research that I do, I do it with the, the people that are on my committee. And I'm still doing research with the people, with, uh, with uh, Dr. Ozermer and Dr. Neumeyer 
we have research going on now in the area of COVID, COVID that we're looking at. We're looking at branding and COVID, doing research in Turkey and in the United States. So that's why in, in uh, research, you're always using the word we, you know, and I'm sure you're wondering <laughs> who are the other people she's talking about. So I talked a little bit about the concept of theory. So a theory is, and in social science, a theory is kind of you're, you're explaining human behavior. You know, so the theory, we chose two different theories to look at. The first theory was globalization. And that was, you know, kind of uh, Thomas Friedman, the world is flat. You know, obviously he's not a, uh, he's, that's not a journal, but just to give you an idea that globalization is the interconnectedness of the entire world, you know, and so how that works and why that works is considered a theory. And there's a lot of theories underneath that. So we took a look at that theory. The theory that we were really interested in was a theory of paradox. Now, a paradox basically is um, two things that look very different than each other, but they're happening at the same time. So it's kind of like two sides of the same coin. You know, if you're looking at one side, you're seeing one thing, and the other side, you're seeing something else. So throughout our research, we did not hear global or local. We heard global and local. So we began to look at these two things and the tension uh, that they create when they try to come together, and then also how they complement each other. And so that's the theory that we are advancing as well in this research. So the studies. Um, so study one, each of the studies as they're laid out, we're looking at what question are we trying to answer. And as I mentioned, this program is a practitioner scholar um, program. So we're trying to look at practice and then answer that question using scholarship, you know, using the academy. So that's why I kind of started with showing you the video, showing you what the problem was in practice. And now we'll move a little bit more towards the scholarship side. Now, if you're used to the scholarship side, this will seem much more, you know, like Ellen's being way more practical, more practice than we need to see. If you're used to practice, as soon as we get into the scholarship, you'll, you'll think I'm going too deep in that. So. Um, just for the next, I'd say, 35 minutes, give me some, uh, some chance to go in the middle and give you scholarship with the practice. So study one, our question was, what is driving success for global and local brands? While I started with an idea of, of learning more about this around the world, we really focused on the United States, global brands in the United States, and local brands in the United States, and global and local brands in China. Our study two was, OK, we learned some things in study one. Can we statistically prove them right or wrong? And then in study three, in most of the cases when people do marketing research, they're using consumers. So in the first two studies, we didn't start with consumers. We started with talking, people, talking to people in the sports product industry. You know, 50 people for the first study, 50 leaders around the world in the sports product industry. The, the second study, we talked to, let's see, it wasn't talked to, it was a survey, 259 brand leaders. And then in the final one, it was 729 consumers. So that changed our approach. And I'll show you a little bit more about that when we take a little closer look at the studies. So in study one, we had, uh, let's see, gosh, we had, had 15,424 codes meaning we had 50 interviews that last on average 61 minutes. Every single word, every sing single phase, phrase that uh, um, a leader used, we coded that to see what are the similarities, what are, what are the leaders telling us. You know, and you can see kind of the open coding, you have a lot of different themes going on. You bring that down to you know, the axillary coding and then the selective coding, and then you go down to, OK, these are some of the major themes that these 50 leaders talked about. And when they're talking to us, they're talking to us about the lived experiences that they've had in the industry. So you're trying to learn through what they've learned through the industry in their years in it. So overall, we found um, the, the initial themes that we we're talking about, and you'll hear this throughout the, the research. We heard the theme of local authenticity. What makes a brand connected to the country that they're from or the country that they're trying to do business in? 
And then we heard global acceptance. What makes a brand a brand? Something that somebody believes um, that they could buy if they're in India or if they're in uh, England, you know. And then what's between the two of them, you know? So that and that's where we found the research gap. That while in the past it was very clear who was global, who was local. Today it's far less clear. But we don't know a lot about the people that are in the middle. So that's part of the why we did the research. Um, so kind of the overall major finding that we found that to succeed in today's connected marketplace, global brands need to become locally authentic, while local brands need to become more globally accepted. So that was kind of the, they need to come together. I love this quote from one of the CEOs of a local company. All local companies aspire to be global, and all global companies pretend to be local. And that was kind of overall what we learned, is that they're coming together. Um, I, I, I like this example. Um, that uh, that uh, and so this gives you a little bit more, you know, like so if they're coming together, what are the things that you're hearing? How is how is a global brand, you know, demonstrating local authenticity? And you can see what we call these all the constructs, or you could say antecedents, you know, the things that are driving local authenticity for the global brands. And I've listed those there: local insights, you know, down to uh, I think positive effect. I always get a question on what is positive effect. And what we heard throughout the interviews is the global brands were so much more positive than the local brands were. You know, and because this is social science and we're learning through human behavior or learning about human behavior, that was something that we studied during this uh, research. And then you can see on the other side, what are the things that the local brands are doing to become more globally accepted? You know, so the kinds of things that they need to do in order for somebody to look at them not as a local brand, but a brand that we could actually buy outside the country that they're from. And as I mentioned, we used the lens of the Chinese companies, the Chinese sports product companies that are trying to get outside of China. So we did a lot of uh, research and a lot of time talking to people at Anta, at Li Ning, at XStep. Um, at peak. Those are the, the Chinese sports brands that we talked to. And then we came up with this concept called Omnibrand. Now, what we found in the 50 interviews that we had, nobody, nobody used the term global. And I would say you would maybe have anticipated that because, first of all, if you spell check it, it will come back global or local. It's not even in our spell, spell checks. This is a term that started in the 1980s, and nobody uses it. You know, so we said, OK, if people are not using this term, is there another term? Is there another thing that we could call this thing, this global um, acceptance and local authenticity? And we came up with the name Omnibrand. Now, um, uh, you know, we believe, obviously, that, that there's, this is not exactly what they saw in the past before connectivity. So we believe it gives us an opportunity um, to rename this. And so that's what we're attempting to do. Um, the new name is, uh, um, you know, we believe that, uh, you know, those that are in the industry say, Ellen, that's not very novel. We have omni-channel that we're talking about all the time. And we would say, exactly, we're connecting to where the industry is going to. If you are going to have a brand in omni-channels, you need an omni-brand to be in those channels. And that's why we took this opportunity to rename this space. And then on to, to study number two. So. Because we had talked to people in the industry in qualitative, and qualitative basically is interviews. You know, so I'm sitting down with them, I'm asking them a series of questions, I'm recording them, I'm coding them, tremendous amount of time and energy. But you could say, okay, Ellen, with the size of the industry, the global industry, you talked to 50 people. You know, I mean, was that enough to really, really create a new theory or a new idea? You know, you got to you have to go beyond that. You need to talk to more people. And so what we do in research is that rather than, OK, now I'm going to do a qualitative research and I'm going to talk to 200 or 300 people, we move to what they call quantitative. So quantitative is an opportunity to talk to more people and to see, is there any relationships here 
that we could statistically prove. You know, is the, you know, when I showed you the antecedents and I, I showed you the new constructs and new ideas of global acceptance and local authenticity, is there a relationship? Is there a correlation between those ideas and the new ideas that you're talking about? So the way you do quantitative research in most cases is through a survey instrument. So we created a survey instrument and we sent it out to the industry. So some of the, you that are online tonight may have taken that survey and I'd like to say thank you. So as a researcher, we, if you fill out surveys, I mean, if, as a researcher, we always fill out surveys because we realize the power of that survey for somebody that's trying to figure out what's going on. You know, if you're trying to build knowledge, a survey instrument allows you to do that. So a survey instrument allowed us to ask questions that were related to all of these initial things that we heard from these 50 people in the qualitative interviews. You know, and this basically shows you that, that we were trying to statistically prove that some of these things that you see are really kind of, we were trying to statistically prove that all of these things were related um, you know, local insights, learning uh, orientation, social network, positive effect was related to, did build local authenticity. And then on the other side, that these things did build global acceptance. And so, and what we found that with the exception of originality, originality did not have a positive effect on global acceptance. It actually had a significant negative effect on global acceptance. And the way, obviously, when you get an unanticipated outcome, it's actually from a researcher standpoint, that's incredible because it's like, okay, now I'm really beginning to learn, you know? And so we have not had a chance to kind of uh, dissect that, go a little bit deeper into why we would have found that. When I went back to the qualitative, the best that I could figure out, and again, this is not statistically proven, this is just, you know, having talked to 50 and now done, in the, in, done the interviews with this, it would appear that if a global brand is too original, meaning it's very different in every single country that it's offered, that the people in that country never really understand that it's a global brand. They see it as a series of different local brands and it doesn't hold uh, the, the weight of a brand that is globally accepted. And so we are digging more into that, but we thought that was really, really interesting. And then you can see the other things that we were able to connect to local authenticity. Remember study two, we are still talking to people that work in the industry and we're doing marketing research. You know, So what the brands really care about are the brands really care about the consumer. You know, they could tell me, Ellen, this is fine, we're great, now we know what our, what, our, what our employees think, we know what more of our employees think, but we really wonder about what, how, do the, well, how does the consumer think about us? You know, is this new area that you've talked to us about, is it important to the consumer? So the rest of our time and the rest of the studies is spent with the consumer. So our question here is, how do we me measure an Omni brand? So if global acceptance and local authenticity is important, then how would a brand know how much they have of those things um, by country? So we created a measurement scale using 729 consumer respondents across 33 different brands. And the majority, you'll see the majority of the brands that we looked at are sports and outdoor uh, companies. Now, this is very confusing. I wasn't sure if I was gonna, going to include it or not. But if you remember the first part of the study, we were looking at things that uh, if you're in a company, you would care about, you know, and that you would, you would speak about. I mean, you know, an area like positive effect or an area like learning orientation, you can't ask consumers those questions. You know, you have to ask consumers questions that they would connect to being a consumer of that brand, not being somebody that works at a brand. You know, so we use the themes that we had heard and then we created consumer questions in order to build that same model that you saw before. How can we have ideas that, that build towards global acceptance? How can innovation, product quality, something called perceived brand globalness, meaning does a brand, is a brand, do you think that brand's global or do you think that brand's not global? 
you know, how do those things build towards global acceptance, which builds to towards Omnibrand. So the same type of things that we were doing when we were talking to people in the industry, but now we're talking to the consumers. And when you're uh, working on branding, the majority of, what the, of the research that we will do going forward will be consumer research. The reason I started with research about the industry is because of being in a practitioner scholar program, we are trying to answer questions. We're trying to use the base of where I'm coming from in order to build new knowledge and new theory. So what did we learn in this third study? Um, uh, we, our new measurement tool basically allowed us to use all the constructs um, and to use those as elements to build a score towards global, uh, global average for each of the brands and a local average for each of the brands. So let's use Nike as an example. So you can see the number of respondents that we had from Nike in the survey. You can see our, the average, because again, we're asking them four to five questions for each of these constructs. So each of the people are asked four or five questions. We average that. And then they have an average score for perceived brand globalness, for innovation, for product performance quality. And I think you won't be surprised that Nike has a relatively high global brand uh, score, right? Then we also score Nike on their local brand score. Now, this survey was only done in the United States. So when you do a survey, when you do any research, you always list your limitations. So the limitations of this is that I'm not saying how locally relevant or locally authentic Nike is in any country other than the United States, because those were where the consumers that we talked to. Um, but we, when we're creating a new tool, we're creating a tool that we can then use in other countries. So then we go through their local authentic uh, score. And this one was a little more surprising to us, um, is that uh, Nike, and again, we're just using Nike as an example, Nike's local authentic score was a little lower than we thought it would be. You know, and it was lower than some other brands. Um, and when you find something that is unanticipated in research, you usually go back and say, OK, were my methods right? Now, the first thing I would question on this is that we only had 15 people. Uh, you know, so that number would be a number we would want to put up from there. You know, and as we duplicate the study, that would be a number that we'd want to increase. But you can see we have many brands that we have um, 20 and some that we have 30. You know, so for 33 brands now, we have a score. We, can, we have a global score for them, and we have a local score for them. So you can imagine what we can do with that now. Now, from I did not include the reliability, validity, all the different uh, mechanisms that we have in place that allow us to say that this is good research. If you're interested in anything beyond what I'm presenting tonight, just reach out to me, and I can provide more information. Um, but I, I, we had a short time tonight, so I only included some of these things that I thought would be more interesting to you. So we did, as you can imagine, we did scatter plot, right? So we took global. And we took local, and we put each of these 33 brands. So we threw Amazon in there, because Amazon in 2020 had been measured by the brand Z. Uh, they had been measured as a number one global brand in the world. And I said, you know what? If they were measured by a different mechanisms, I wonder how they'd be measured in, in, if we're looking at a measurement tool. So you can see that Amazon appears pretty much where you would expect them to appear. So maybe our measurement tool has some merit. Well, Nike appears probably a little lower than you, what you would have expected, right? You know, so I mean, there might be something there. I mean, if I were, if I had uh, maybe 30 people in there, I might mention the Nike. You might want to look a little bit more at your local authenticity in the United States. Are you connecting to the people in the United States? So the integrated findings now, now that we kind of know how to measure a brand, which we did that in study three, now we want to try to bring together study one, study two, study three. And now that we know that this concept that we have called omnibrand, is there any, any you know, kind of like, so what? You know, and that's where you get to on all research is your so what? Like, who cares? You know, so all brands are global and local now. All brands could be measured in their level of local authenticity and their level of global acceptance. But so what? You know, so our so what of the integrative findings was saying, well, if you are more globally accepted and locally authentic, 
you know, do you have more brand power? You know, and I think every brand cares about that. You know, so that's what we measured. We measured that for each of the brands, but we also measured it on taking our brands and saying, okay, what if you have more of it? You know, what if you're high brand power or what if you're low brand power? What if you're high omni brand or low omni brand? So you'll see how we took a look at brand power. So we took the 33 brands and we um, decided through um, cluster analysis which ones were considered high omni brand. So their scores were high enough to be clustered into something that we named high omni brand. We then looked at, and again, we looked at just a two cluster in this. We also looked at three and four, but we felt like this model fit best with a two cluster approach. So we looked at high and we looked at low. So we took the 33 brands and we broke them into these two different categories. Once we had the brands broken into these two different categories, now we can measure brand power. And that's what we did. So we took a look at Omni brand. The, if you're a high Omni brand or a low Omni brand, what, how does that connect to your brand power? And we found that if you have a high Omni brand, so if you have higher global acceptance, higher local authenticity, you have more brand power than if you have lower global acceptance and lower local authenticity. You know, so, and that was significant. That difference was significant. So while you can say the so what of this is that if you can create a brand that is both globally accepted and locally authentic, it will have more power than a brand that is not, you know, so, or a brand that has less of that, you know, so that became our overall finding in the dissertation. And so with the defense, what I did on February 10th is that I defended that, uh, um, that find. You know, and I had to defend it in front of the committee and the community at Case Western Reserve. And they asked some very good questions. And I had to do some additional analysis to show them how I clustered the brands, how I measured brand power. Because your question can be, what's brand power? You know, it's a combination between brand awareness and brand equity. You know, what questions did you ask? You know, and how did you statistically um, prove it? What was your reliability? All of those kinds of questions are things that a committee would ask. Uh, and then obviously as a defendant, you would hope you could answer. You know, and we were able to answer those successfully or I was able to answer those successfully. And then I received my PhD from um, Case Western. So that is, um, these are just a few other charts that show the difference between high omni brand and low omni brand for brand power. Um, and then the implica implications, I cannot say that word tonight, <laughs> and contribution. Um, just expanding how brands are categorized, measured, uh, and researched to include omni-brand, uh, extends the brand paradox theory, and then creates a roadmap for current brands. The reason I like to, uh, to start presentations showing the mistakes that brands are making is because it also begins to answer the so what. You know, so if we already know that a brand should be globally accepted and locally authentic, then why are we making the mistakes that we're making? So we may know it, but we're not practicing it. So part of OmniBrand is creating a framework that helps brands understand how to add, if I'm a strong local brand like 361, how do I become globally accepted? You know, I don't sponsor the Olympics, I drive innovation and product quality, you know, into my products. You know, if I'm a global brand like D&G, how do I become locally authentic? You know, I listen to the consumer. You know, I, I listen to the insights of the consumer. You know, I, I, I'm a, I become an icon for local. You know, I, I understand what's going on in the local market. So it gives a roadmap for the people in the industry to know how to become not just one, but both. And that's the, the paradox theory as well. 
So obviously a tremendous amount of thanks go when you do your dissertation uh, in, in an in a industry. Uh, probably everything that happens in industry gets paid for. Everything that happens on the academy side, people do it because they're passionate about something. And then obviously everybody would like to publish and create new, new knowledge. So we're hoping to be able to do that with this uh, and be able to continue our research as we move forward. So I thank you for your time tonight. Uh, Shelley, I don't know if we have any questions that I can take. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, excellent. <laughs> um, we do have a couple of questions. So Great. Um, to begin with, um, we heard from CK, um, asked a question, said, is the sports industry mature? Um, are there room for new brands um, in, in, on this globe? Yeah, and I, th I think, I mean, that's a great question, Steve. Um, I think when you look at this market, and the reason that I looked at this market, I mean, other than the fact that I had almost 30 years in the industry, I had access to people in the industry, which would you say that's why I picked it. The other reason is that um, I studied the automobile industry. Um, and if you look at the automobile industry, this all happened to them in the 50s. You know, Toyota came to the United States, and I think it was 1957. And people laughed at their cars, and they went home with the tail between their legs. You know, Li Ning just did that in 2012. You know, so I think what we're seeing in this industry is what other industries have seen in the past. You know, the automobile industry back in the 1950s, if you would have told them Toyota is going to be the biggest car manufacturer in the world and everybody's going to own Toyota, everybody would have laughed, right? You know, so I think in the 2020, I can tell you without a doubt, you know, that Li Ning and Anta are going to be the biggest sports brands in the world, you know, and everybody is going to wear them, you know, and, and people are going to laugh, you know, but that's where we are with this industry right now with these Chinese competitors. And that's why I was so interested in studying this, because I thought we're in a point of time that we've seen other industries already go through. But I think, you know, it took Toyota how many decades to do it? You know, today things are moving so quickly in China. You know, 10 years in China is an incredible amount of time. You know, and so I think you're going to see it, it happen in this industry much more quickly. You know, so if you ask the question, Steve, from is it mature from a, an Adidas standpoint and from a European standpoint, I would say yes. You know, Puma, Adidas, you know, the original Reebok, that's pretty mature. Is it mature from a, a US standpoint? Getting there. You know, I mean, Nike will turn 50 in 2022. You know, Under Armour is much younger. You know, uh, Lululemon out of Canada is, is you know, certainly going to give them a run for their money. You know, something very new is happening in the industry with Chinese companies buying international brands. You know, so, yeah, probably more maturity is to come. And then I would say in China, it's not mature at all. It's a, very, it's a local, you know, this industry is very, very local, you know, and they're taking their time. And if you know China, it's fine to take your time. Get it right at home and then get it right globally. And I think what I'm seeing is, and I saw this with uh, the travels that I recently had in Asia, not recently, not during the pandemic, but before that, is that the Chinese brands are penetrating the rest of Asia. And people never thought that the Japanese would buy Chinese sports brands. You know, they thought that the Japanese companies, Mizuno, Asics, they thought, okay, we're all set. We can sell volleyball, badminton. We can sell all those shoes all day long because nobody, you know, Nike's never going to make those shoes and nobody's going to buy the Chinese shoes. Guess what? They are. You know, the Japanese that are so picky about their quality, they're buying the Chinese brands. So the Chinese brands are learning. They're also learning from the big brands that are based in their country. You know, Adidas is huge in, in China right now. Nike is huge, you know, and personnel moves around in Asia very, very fluidly. You know, it's not like, you know, the Ellen's having a 27 year career at Nike. You know, I mean, people move between the companies, you know, so, and that's what I found with my research as well. People that used to be at global brands working in local brands and then vice versa as well. So I think, you know, kind of long-winded, but I do think it's, it, it depends on the region that you're in. And I think it, it is, uh, it's a market that we're going to see mature and move forward, particularly with, the, with China being 
a big part of uh, what's going on in the sports and outdoor industry. OK, Shelley, I can't hear you now. That's my fault, muted. So <laughs> um, we have um, maybe a couple of other questions. And I also want to just note that I think we have a hard stop at 625. Is that right? Yes. Uh -huh. so we've got about four minutes. So I'm, I'm going to, um, Chris asks, um, do you suggest that global brands localize their advertising and marketing efforts? And to what extent? Yeah, that's a great, and really there's, there's literature on this. I mean, obviously there's been a lot written about this on the practice side. There's also on the academy side specific to advertising. And really the whole concept of adding local to global happened, the research happened in the area of advertising because you can do research in something that you can reach out and touch and also something that consumers experience, consume, you know, so... So uh, consumers consume advertising. So it's something that can be studied and has been studied on the practice side by their marketing firms. It's also been, it's also been studied on the academy side. So what they know is that if you add local tenants or if you add local traits to your advertising, that it will help you locally. You know, so, and those local things that you're adding could be everything from recognizing that colors are looked at differently by country. You know, what colors are you using in your advertising? That has been looked at by the academy as well as by the practice side. What language are you using in your advertising? And that one you see, it's pretty easy, right? You know, um, also a big one, and, and this becomes a little bit more difficult, particularly for the smaller brands, is how are you sizing your products? You know, if your products are sized only for Western and you're trying to sit, sell in Eastern, that will become difficult for you longer term. Um, also, what I found with my research, and I heard this kind of throughout the 50 interviews, is that, that the consumers are demanding more from their brands. And you also see this on the academy side. They've, they've studied this. Consumers are demanding more of their brands. So let me use McDonald's as an example. So McDonald's and KFC, both in China. McDonald's has been there for a long time, very long time. And they've adjusted a bit of their menu. You know, they have some noodles, they've adjusted a bit of their menu. KFC comes in, they adjust all of their menu. They, they do everything in the local language. They hire all local managers. They're in the, the second, third, and fourth tier cities. Now, KFC has 8,000 uh, restaurants in China, and they are incredibly profitable. McDonald's, not doing so well. They have half as many restaurants, and they're starting to do better now because they're owned by a Chinese company. They're both owned by Chinese companies, in fact. But one made the decision that they would do a little bit local. And if you look at, at uh, uh, McDonald's kind of around the world, they do a little bit local. You know, but they're a global brand. They want to keep it global, right? You know, and in the past, that might be fine. It might be OK. You know, because I really wanted to buy a Big Mac, but maybe I can get noodles there too. You know, so the consumer is the one that's driving the amount of local that needs to be considered by global brands. You know, so they're they're demanding. They want more. You know, in most countries. You know, and I think that if you look at how much more a brand is going to give, you also have to look at the economy of scale. You know, so some of the little countries are never going to get their own colors, their own sizing, their own thing from a big brand because they're never going to be big enough to make it profitable for a global brand. So, Shelley, I think I can, I can take one more question. So, okay, um, there it is, six twenty-five. But one more question. Okay, he is on is on the live stream. He says, "How do you account for the for political views of brands and separate that from opinions of product?" Yes, that's a great one. So I did my research in 2017, 2018, and 2019. So that was, that wasn't 2020, you know, but that was enough after our election that I heard a strong nationalism um, talked about kind of throughout. Um, we didn't study it on the quantitative. I didn't ask any questions about politics or nationalism, but I heard it throughout the qualitative. Um, uh, research that I did. 
And so there is actually a tremendous amount of literature coming out now in 2020 about the whole move away from globalization, you know, towards national. And so nationalization, you know, you could say, and particularly in the United States, in 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 Europe, you're seeing it. You're you're seeing it in China. There, uh, there's obviously a political um, piece in that. But the whole concept of nationalism and globalization has been studied quite a bit. And if this is a pendulum, just like let's pretend it's continuum, global to local, you know, and I want to study in the middle, where is, you know, that continuum now, you know, as far as globalization versus nationalization? A lot of people would argue that it's beginning to move this direction. It's beginning to move away from globalization and moving towards nationalization. And as it moves in that area, it becomes much more complicated for businesses. Because in every case in this industry, I'll just talk to the sports product industry, every company is global. Every company is global. It doesn't matter where they're selling. They're making globally. You know, They're advertising. They're receiving awards globally, you know, so that it's going to become much more complicated. When you're a researcher, you're, you always say it's going to become much more interesting, you know, because we don't really understand. There's been some studies done around what they call country of origin. I'm actually a tremendous number of, of, of uh, um, studies done on country of origin, like where are you from? But in this industry, there's been far less done on country of manufacturing meaning what are they going to do in China when they're, you know, if they're boycotting a U.S. brand, but that product's made in China, you know, what does that look like? They, there has been some research done in that area in cars, but never in sports products, you know. So I think it's going to get very, very interesting. So also a good academic never answers questions, just, just says these are good questions and these are certainly things we need to take a look at. So thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. And... Uh, uh, go Ducks, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you, Ashley. David, Sean, thank you so much for tonight. Thanks.